Good luck. There seem to have been two main goals behind the kickstarted revival of R-Type in the form of R-Type Final 2. One goal was to pay tribute to one of the most legendary shmup series ever made and offer fans something like a celebration of its storied history. The other goal, and I quote from the Kickstarter page, was to be a brand new the best shmup ever. The first goal I believe has been met pretty well. R-Type Final 2 offers dozens of ships, a museum that you can tour in 3D, heaps of customization options, both a gallery and a Baidu directory, posable pilots who will stand in front of your craft for funny screenshots, and just a ton of stuff for fans of the series to take their time exploring. Not only that, there is a really good amount of in-game content too, with each run consisting of seven stages, but the game branching off into three different routes after stage five, giving players a lot to try to achieve. And there's even a bunch of DLC stages available to backers, with even more in the offing. In terms of meeting the second goal, on the other hand, R-Type Final 2 comes up very short. Not only is it not a brand new the best shmup ever, not only is it not the best R-Type ever, it may face a bit of a struggle to even convince people it's the best R-Type final ever. That doesn't mean it's a disaster by any stretch. Fans of the series will surely find a lot to enjoy here. It's just that it's not an unqualified success either. Now, R-Type has always been a bit different. Its slower pacing, brooding atmosphere, and almost puzzle-like approach to stage design have always set it apart from most other shmups. And R-Type Final 2 stays true to a lot of the series' most identifying characteristics. However, staying true to those characteristics and actually pulling them off with equivalent success are quite different things. First things first, mechanically the game will be immediately familiar to most people who've played an R-Type game before. You have a standard forward shot and a chargeable cannon, some versions of which can be charged up through two or even three power levels to fire off a powerful blast that varies ship to ship. You also have four movement speeds which you cycle through with the left shoulder buttons. The game's most unique mechanic, however, is of course the iconic force. That, for anyone who doesn't know, is the orange ball-like attachment for either the front or rear of your craft. When attached, the force unit will fire either ahead or behind, depending where it's placed, and you can collect power-ups to give it additional firepower. Furthermore, the force can be launched directly at enemies to inflict initial collision damage, and if you don't recall it, it will float ahead or behind you, firing off shots to hit enemies who are, for example, hidden behind a stage element. Leaving it to its own devices is, however, not without its risks, as the force acts as a protective shield and has the ability to absorb certain enemy bullets. Absorbing bullets and launching the force at enemies both charge a meter in the bottom left of the screen, and when this is full, you have the chance to unleash an extremely powerful bomb attack. In other words, one does not simply hold down fire and dodge. There are a lot of tactics involved, and there's no doubt these mechanics combine to make for a fascinating and versatile system that rewards experimentation and demands thought to master. These mechanics play into what can sometimes feel like a kind of puzzle-esque approach to some of the gameplay. You cannot just go in all guns blazing and hope your reflexes will stave off disaster. Instead, you have to scope out areas, work out what approach is going to serve you best, and then hopefully pull it off. When done right, this can be both engaging and rewarding, but unfortunately, I feel R-Type Final 2 rarely does this right. Instead, it relies far too much on pure trial and error. Instead of, for example, observing a boss in the early stages of an encounter while you work out how to get at its weak spot, you all too often drift into an area, take a cheap shot there's no way you could have predicted, then come back now knowing which spot to avoid. After getting a few seconds further this time, you take another cheap shot, and now you know a later spot to avoid. You come back and progress a little further in the fight, and then boom, cheap shot, come back, and so on and so on. This isn't always the case, of course, but it happens too often for, I'd imagine, most people's liking, and it's not just boss fights, it's an issue throughout the whole game. Some of these you do learn to pick up on some subtle signalling, but other times deaths just feel almost entirely random and unfair. 
This is true most of all when it comes to background elements where it's all too often completely impossible to predict what will and won't cause you harm, and there are even some frankly ludicrous sections where things that couldn't harm you at one point do harm you seconds later. You also have the reverse problem where certain objects will fly across your path and you'll desperately try to dodge out their way only to find they actually can't hurt you, but oops, because you were dodging them you flew into a piece of innocuous looking background scenery that did kill you. This aspect of the game is, to be totally honest, a bit of a mess, and will no doubt be the cause of immense frustration to people learning the game early on. And it's not just cheap shots that'll get you. On certain sections you'll be expected to move in quite tight areas while the camera just kind of flops about side to side, then up and down, and moves you along with it. You're also frequently presented with what seem like fairly arbitrary choices, but are actually borderline traps. For example, a giant cannon is about to fire through the centre of the screen, and you can either go above or below its blast. Choose up, and you'll find yourself in clear space with just a relatively easy swarm of popcorn enemies to take out. Choose down, and you'll probably just die as you end stuck in a tight space with no wiggle room for when something flies in unsignaled from the bottom of the screen. Now you will know to just choose up next time, but is this sort of trial and error fun? Not for me. And there is a second less obvious issue with these cheap deaths, namely that once you know about them, they often become quite easy to avoid. And this is the case here. As you learn the game, sure, it gets more enjoyable because you're dying less, but also it can get a little boring because you're just following an almost set path. With that cannon example, you now know to go up. And that's it, now that section is pretty easy. There are relatively few sections where you get to take on bunches of enemies and just react. Instead, if you're not feeling frustrated, you're likely feeling bored. None of this is helped by the retention of the game's infamous checkpoint system. Now I should say that I do understand that a checkpoint system, while often considered a wee bit frustrating, is kind of necessary for this game. If you just respawned and could keep going, the game would lose a lot of what makes it tick. However, its implementation here frequently leaves a lot to be desired. Firstly, the game often places checkpoints immediately before a stretch of nothing. One of the most extreme examples of this is the stage 2 boss where you keep restarting behind a closed door that you have to first drift towards, then just sit behind while you wait for it to be opened. This gets very boring, very quickly, and is only exacerbated by the even bigger problem of the game on Switch at least, taking about 10 seconds to give you control of your ship again from the moment of death. Add that to the floating through nothing approach, and if you die against a boss, it's frequently about 30 seconds before you're actually doing anything halfway interesting again. In a game in which you're going to die as much as you're going to die in R-Type Final 2, this is a real, real problem. And by the way, if you think turning down the difficulty is going to make things more palatable, think again. Sure, it does make some sections easier, but since the main difficulty comes from background elements and unpredictable cheap shots, difficulty options don't affect things as much as you'd think. And on the topic of difficulty, what kept occurring to me more and more the more I played was that the level designers behind this just have no idea what is and isn't difficult for players. Stage 1 aside, there isn't really much escalation through most of the game. There's a certain section in the middle of stage 3 that I imagine is going to cause a lot of people a lot of frustration, but if you're worried that if the game's so tough by stage 3, there's no way you'll be able to handle the later stages, don't be. You are probably enduring the most difficult section in the entire game. In fact, stage 4 is then one of the easiest stages of all, since while bombs are very difficult to build up in every other stage, stage 4 offers you the option to just go nuts with them because you can recharge the meter in seconds multiple times through the stage. This lack of balance is exhibited throughout the game, and I'm not sure difficulty is even the right word to describe it. And talking of stage 3, let's talk about the visuals. Now, stage 3 has already become kind of infamous. I don't think anyone really knows why it looks so bad, but let's give the developers the benefit of the doubt and say it's unfinished, because most of the rest of the game does look better. The enemies come in all sorts of imaginative shapes and forms, and while they're not quite as grotesque as some of those found in earlier R-types, they can be quite unusual. Bosses are more of a mixed bag, some offer up some quite unique creations, while others are very dull. 
One thing they almost all have in common though are these very lame death animations. Stage 3 aside, the backgrounds are detailed and well realised, especially some of the later branching path stages, with most stages feeling very clear and distinct from the others, and in general the atmosphere is quite well captured. However, you can't escape the feeling that there's just a little more flash to the visuals than is necessary. It's a case where I think the higher budget has actually done more harm than good. It's like they've gone for this big budget effect, but they don't really have the budget to pull it off. It almost feels at times like the video game equivalent of a local council coming up to the end of a financial year. They have money, and so have to spend it on something, and so in this case just added a bunch of effects that don't serve any real purpose except to distract, and on occasion even obscure important gameplay relevant objects. I hesitate to use the word, but there is on occasion something almost Euro schmuppy about things. And that to me raises an interesting point. If R-Type Final 2 did not have the legendary name and iconic ship types of the series it's reviving, if it were instead called something like Dream Legend and Fantasia and was released by some unknown European studio, what would the reaction be? My guess is it may well get a bit of attention for its visuals, but I really don't see many people giving it the time of day, and certainly not at the current price. Now, I don't think R-Type Final 2 is necessarily a bad game, but nor do I think it's a very fun one. The classic mechanics are still as interesting to play around with as ever, the visuals, while often rough around the edges, are decent enough, and the amount of content for fans to get stuck into is vast. But the main thing, the actual experience of playing through the stages, is far too often, far too frustrating, and I can't help feeling most people are going to come away from this with their overriding feeling being, to a greater or lesser extent, disappointment. Things do get more enjoyable once you've learned the stages, and the tribute aspect is handled well, so overall I would still give R-Type Final 2 a 6 out of 10, but if you are tempted by it, I'd recommend holding on for a save. I've already seen tons of people putting up little snippets of gameplay of this on Twitter, etc, so I'm sure a lot of you will have already tried it out. I've got a feeling it is going to split opinion in a big way, so I'll be really intrigued to see people's thoughts on this one, and I look forward to continuing the discussion in the comments. Thank you all as ever for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Cheers.